Okay, um, good evening. Um, so you may wonder what a Minneapolitan is doing here uh, between uh, ETH and California. Um, but actually, I, I, I belong here very, very well because um, I did my PhD in physics at UCLA, but I actually did my work in CERN in Switzerland. So Switzerland, not necessarily ETH, Switzerland meets California. So, um, oh, that's the end of my uh, talk. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> that was pretty tricky, Kevin. <laughs> I'm notorious for taking a, a lot more. Okay, so um, I have uh, the task uh, of trying to describe uh, the Zooniverse in 15 minutes. Uh, and not only the Zooniverse, but the role the Zooniverse plays in Citizen Science 2.0. Uh, so the story has to begin, as Kevin alluded to, with uh, the Galaxy Zoo story. And the Galaxy Zoo story um, was uh, started with a seemingly innocent question about uh, galaxy evolution, which was, what fraction of galaxies are blue ellipticals? Okay. So uh, as it turns out, galaxies have basically two types of morphologies or shapes. On the left-hand side, we see a spiral, and they typically are blue in color because there's a lot of star formation going on. On the right-hand side, we see a smoother shape or an elliptical uh, galaxy, and they tend to be red because their frantic period of star formation has ended. So they're known colloquially as red and dead. Uh, so it's easy enough for astronomers to actually measure color. So we can tell the difference between red galaxies and blue galaxies fairly easily. The difficulty is in understanding the difference between the morphologies, okay? The images are a lot more complex. So for example, if you had a faint spiral, it could masquerade as a smooth or an elliptical uh, galaxy. So in the past, uh, sort of through the 20th century up until um, the last couple of decades, uh, astronomers, since there's only been about hundreds or maybe even 10,000 uh, galaxies to classify the morphology for, this has been done visually. So that works, you know, up through 10,000 of galaxies. Maybe the uh, <coughs> professor could do it for 100, but maybe by the time you get to 10,000 galaxies, you ask the graduate student to do it. Uh, but then what happens when you get into um, the latter half of the last century and up into this century with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey picture here, we have a million galaxies. Now, Kevin <laughs> tried uh, to um, start classifying those visually, got up to 50,000 in a week, I think, right? Uh, and. Um, um, as the story goes, uh, uh, went with a colleague to a pub and said, um, I'm not doing this anymore. Uh, 50,000 a week is too much. Um, we still have, you know, on order of a million left to go. Okay, so, uh, uh, so um, they, they, um, they, you, you'll see what happened next. But um, the real question is, is what do we do now when not only do we have to solve what we do with a million galaxies, but in the next decade, we are going to have 10 billion galaxy images that we need to classify the morphologies for. And we need the morphologies in order to understand a lot of galaxy evolution. All right, so how are we gonna do this? Clearly, we need computers to do this, okay? So um, the problem with computers is, it's gonna go back to the color. I said it's very relatively easy for astronomers to measure color. It's also relatively easy for a computer then to, to measure color. So how can computers measure the morphology of galaxies? Well, it relies on this relationship between the blue and spiral versus the red and elliptical. So it uses, a computer will use color as a proxy. However, if we return to the original question that Kevin wanted to ask or answer, 
what fraction of galaxies are blue ellipticals if your computer algorithm is using color as a proxy, it's saying I'm going to take all the red galaxies and call them ellipticals and all the blue galaxies and call them spirals. Well, you just tossed out all of the blue ellipticals and Kevin can't do his research project. So that was the motivation for Kevin to actually count, uh, you know, actually visually classify as many galaxies as he could. So on that famous night at the pub, when they realized 50,000 wasn't enough, they need to get uh, more, um, uh, uh, they asked the question, if the computer is gonna use a proxy, we need a better algorithm to process complex data. So what is that algorithm? Well, we know it's the human brain, right? Because that's what's been doing the visual classification up to then. But we only had one brain, Kevin, doing it. Uh, so um, how can we um, computerize this algorithm up here? Well, the answer, we wouldn't be all here uh, if this wasn't the answer, but it's crowdsourcing, okay? So we take all of your brains put together and even 100,000 more uh, working together, we can solve this problem of galaxy morphology, okay? And in fact, that is what happened. In uh, 2007, uh, Kevin and colleagues, Chris Lintot and others at the University of Oxford launched Galaxy Zoo uh, and invited the public to participate in this process of galaxy uh, morphology classification through a very simple interface they just had to decide whether the galaxy was smooth uh, or was it a spiral in shape. Um, and amazingly, this caught on. It was unbelievably popular. Um, at the end of the project, 40 million classifications. So there was 1 million Sloan galaxies. Each of those galaxies was classified on average 40 times, right? And so then, you get a probability distribution of what the morphology of the galaxy actually is. And 150,000 users took part in this, uh, in this process. And that equates to roughly three and a third continuous person years of effort. Okay? Okay. Wild success. Right? Now, alluding to what uh, Dirk has said. It's not just astronomy, right? So we have all of the sensors, everything in our pocket fill, filled with sensors, everything that we do, all our movements, all our shopping, everything, it's all there, it's data, okay? And we have a um, big data problem, right? And it's not just astronomy, even if we just wanna limit it, take the shopping away and just limit it to the sciences, right? So we have this data deluge and the issue is, in that data, there's a huge volume of data, there's a huge variety or complexity of the data, uh, there is the velocity of the data, and I like to add a fourth, the veracity, okay? Um, you know, what's true in all of that data? What is the, what, what, you know, right? Now, the real issue is, as Dirk alluded to, we, Computers are only able to keep up so much. So we have this huge gap in our ability to analyze the data. So humans and our brains, uh, one of the best algorithms to analyze data, can help fill this gap. And so that is the motivation for citizen science overall, and not just for Galaxy Zoo. So for us, in Galaxy Zoo, the question was, could did people want to do something other than look at galaxies? Um, and it turned out, if we were to expand this idea to other uh, types of science, um, we needed to ask that question. And we asked that question of 20,000 people who have participated in Galaxy Zoo. And the amazing and resounding answer was, contribute to research. That is what motivated people to do Galaxy Zoo. It wasn't because they liked looking at pretty pictures of galaxies, although there were, you know, that was a nice byproduct, okay? Let's pause a second to think about this. Okay. There is a desire by members of the public to contribute to something meaningful. 
this is what we have to seize. Okay? To talk about what Dirk was saying at the end of his presentation, this is what we have to, we have to inspire people to look deep within themselves and realize you want to make a difference? It's, you know, do it. Or, you know, unless I sound like a Nike advertisement, you know, just do it. Right? So it's here. We have the opportunity for you to, to participate in real research. So we did. We expanded to, uh, as Kevin uh, said, from archaeology all the way up to uh, uh, zoology. Uh, the Zoomers uh, launched in uh, 2010. Um, this was the home page back then. Um, we had maybe, I don't know, six projects back when I could keep track of them all. I actually did them all myself. Um, and uh, this is what we look. Whoops! This is what we look like today. Um, um, we've got uh, 48 current projects going on, um, and uh, this is just a chart that shows you what the growth of the Zooniverse is through 2012. And each of these uh, little spikes is a launch of a new project. Right? And then we can see that this carries on into 2016. Um, the growth is amazing. Uh, the growth is a lot now by word of mouth. Um, we now have roughly 1.5 million people worldwide. Okay, So this is an amazing success for us. S over 60 projects. One of the critical things that we have to say about Zooniverse is uh, that we actually make sure that the projects that are on our platform publish science. So we do not want to waste the volunteers' effort and time. You go on, you contribute to science, you want to see the results published. So 100 plus peer-reviewed papers, and in one year, in 2015, if you add all the volunteer effort up, you get 110 plus full-time equivalent effort. Okay, that's um, a great accomplishment. Okay, huge success, yippee! Okay, so the crowd really wins on this one. Um, from our penguinwatch.org, maybe that guy didn't quite get counted back up there, but. <laughs> All right, this guy is saying, hold, hold on a second. All right, if, if you're that successful, how do you build all those projects anymore? Aha, uh -huh. yes, so we were being inundated by requests by researchers to build projects to be on the Zooniverse platform. So that was getting to be a big bottleneck, our ability to actually do the development. So thanks to Google and uh, Sloan, we received a funding to build what we call the Project Builder. And we have now given research teams, the people now have the power to build a project on their own. Okay? So this was launched several months ago. Um, and uh, this is a fairly uh, a straightforward thing if you've ever built a blog. You use a template form, there's uh, workflows in it, uh, etc. You load your data in, it can be public, it can be private, it's great. Uh, so, one of our first ones was a, uh, a fossil finder project. Um, so, you have some drones taking pictures in Kenya. Um, you need to be able to look at all those pictures and decide where fossils might have been uncovered by uh, recent rains. Uh, you can't just have the scientists driving back and forth, up and down, across this huge amount of area. So you need the citizen scientists to come in and look at the pictures and identify, hey, this one looks like it has fossils in it. All right, so this is uh, the, the team uh, ground truthing the uh, project. In fact, there were some uh, fossils found. Uh, they drove out to the site, and they found exactly what they were looking for. So. Tomorrow, for those of you going to the hack day, make sure you see the Project Builder demo by Brooke Simmons, um, and uh, you know, build your own Zooniverse project. So another wonderful thing right now, a milestone for us, is we're just starting to see the science coming in from our first independently built projects on the Project Builder. 
And there's so many other things that I'd like to take the time to tell you about. So, uh, you know, from our Snapshot Serengeti project, um, he wants us to talk about all the amazing experiments that we do to make sure that people stay engaged. Can't tell you too much about that. Uh, from our Planet Hunters project, um, they want me to tell you all about the amazing discoveries that you guys have done, that the citizens have done, without help from scientists, okay? So this is a, uh, a recent paper, uh, um, the alien megastructure, anybody hear about that? Right? Okay, that's this paper here, right? So Planet Hunters volunteer found this, um, so we're making lots of discoveries together with you. Okay, so what is the role that Zooniverse plays in Citizen Science 2.0, apart from allowing you to build your own citizen science projects? Right? So there are a lot of things, but I picked this one, and it is the relationship, the ever-changing relationship between humans and machines. And the fact is, is that with citizen science, we now have the opportunity, instead of making a competition between humans and machines, we find a way to make them work together. Okay, so not so bad to have color as a proxy, the machines can do a lot of, of, of work, right? They're really, really, really good at numbers. They're not very good at complexity. Okay. So you want to make them work together. So one of the things we can do is we can have the humans go through these big, huge data sets and find the anomalous events. Then you find enough of those anomalous <laughs> events, you characterize those anomalous events, and all of a sudden you've got a training set you can then use to train a machine algorithm or improve your machine algorithm, and then the machine goes through and takes the 10 billion galaxies and comes up with answers for those 10 billion galaxies for certain questions. Meanwhile, the, science, uh, the, uh, the citizen scientists continue along their own way making discoveries. And you combine this together um, and you have, dare I say it, a beautiful thing. Okay, so the vision then for the future is that you have a seamless knowledge discovery system that optimizes the human-machine partnership, okay? So you've got all that data coming in, and one of the first things we have to do is get rid of this erroneous idea, this false dichotomy, that you have a separation between data producers and consumers. We're all producing data, we're all consuming data, okay? Right now, the idea is, as you were alluding to, that we have to, we have to uh, you know, wait to consume the data that the data producers are, are making, right? We make our own data, we consume our own data. We have the power to take control of that, okay? So, in this process, we work together as data producers and consumers, and integrating across disciplines, knowledge systems, and data types, we create this amazing future. So for example, just taking climate change as a tiny example, <laughs> right? Together we can tackle it, because we have different pieces of information coming in from literally all over the world. It's a global climate change. We need all that information coming together, federated, and, and work together with the uh, computers. We need people, citizen science isn't just about uh, you know, data from machines. Citizen science is actually people out in their environments, in their areas, writing things down on paper, okay? In Siberia, in Africa, in places where it's not so easy to get the internet. Right? And that information can get shipped back and uh, transcribed. So we end up with um, optimized knowledge discovery processes. And at the same time, we have more informed citizens, which then enable policy changes. So together, humans and machines, we can work together and really tackle climate change. And we can do all that great analysis in astronomy, too. <laughs> Thank you.